Hi, everyone. Welcome back to our podcast from the Kama Sutra to 2020. And Anvita and I are delighted today to have with us Dr. Varuna Srinivasan. Varuna is a huge entity on um, Instagram. She's a very, very dear personal friend, of course. But aside from that, she is an award-winning sex health expert, writer, and advocate, and is going to be with us today answering a lot of questions that both Anvita and I have been getting on bisexuality. Varuna, welcome. Thank you so much for having me on this podcast. I'm so excited. I think Anvita and I just realized after the last one that we did that there are so many questions that um, we felt that we just needed an expert to um, you know, respond to for us because sometimes we miss out on, or we can't put it across maybe as succinctly um, uh, you know, with specific um, things. So. Um, yes. Or sometimes um, they just don't believe us and they need like somebody else to come and say, this is the truth. And so <laughs> hopefully they'll believe you if they don't believe yes, us. I, yeah. hope so too. <laughs> I also want to say that the, the podcast is called From the Kama Sutra to 2020, even though we are in 2023, uh, because we hold we hold to the belief that nothing in the world of sex and sexuality has truly changed since you know, since 5,000 years ago, actually. So um, it doesn't matter. The dates don't matter. Um, so I'm going to actually start with um, the most often received question, which is, I don't understand what is bisexual. That is, yes. Um, I also get that question a lot uh, from someone who talks a lot about my own bisexuality. I think in a nutshell, I can explain, um, and I prefer the term bisexual or bisexuality plus, because bisexuality is an umbrella term, um, as most people do not know. And it is the B and LGBT. Many people seem to forget that. Um, but it is sexual attraction. And that is, you know, underscoring the word sexual attraction um to two or more genders right and so um under the term or the label bisexuality plus you have other identities and labels such as being bisexual um pansexual fluid uh queer or uh questioning um and i think as we move forward um into of course the now 2023, um, it is evolving and I think sexuality is evolving with it. And so um, that's bisexuality in a nutshell. Actually, I'm glad you said this thing about uh, bisexuality plus and brought mm -hmm. in the idea that it's several, it can be two or more yeah. gender sexualities, et cetera. And that it's also fluid because that's yes. the one thing that um, Anvita, you want to take over from here about how we got so much flack about trying to explain how normal it was. Yeah, <laughs> I think as in we would love for you to speak on because I think it's a very complex idea. This thing about being fluid, you know, and and that okay. your identity can be shifting or fluid, or you know, it can change because I think most people believe in the idea that and, and this is true within the lgbtq community as well that once you have chosen to be gay you can't suddenly like it can't change but you yeah. know more and more people are now come talking about their identities being fluid and obviously right. it becomes somewhat confusing it takes it's a longer journey maybe sometimes to say okay i i, I am sexually attracted to multiple genders but I might be committed in one gender and then what is my identity? So, uh, you know, how do you speak to that and uh, what is your experience be? So there are several things there in what you just said, but I, I think I will focus on the first part, which is um, we always seem to think in terms of a binary, right? Like we live in a society mm -hmm. that's so hell-bent on living within this idea that gay or straight, right? Man or woman, uh, male, female, right? Um, and there are always just two extremes. And the idea that sexuality is a spectrum, and I, I don't like to think of it as a linear scale almost, mm -hmm. and no one is like measuring, and there isn't a criterion or a point system where if you fill out a quiz or a form or a questionnaire that you get so many points and that determines who you are and that is what you are on that scale, 
Um, and it's not so much black and white. And so I like to think of sexuality and the spectrum as being a circle and you can be anywhere on that circle, right? Because we're such, I mean, being human is such an amazing thing and the attraction that we feel is so complex, right? And when we think about sexuality, again, we think it's just sex. So who we want to have sex with, who we are attracted to, right? And I think it extends so much more beyond that. And so at the end of the day, I think we're all kind of indoctrinated into the culture of heteronormativity where we are constantly grown up to think that, oh, girls, you know, are going to have crushes on boys and boys are going to have crushes on girls. And, you know, we have to resonate with the sex that we're assigned at birth. But again, we are complex human beings and we're going to break out of that mold eventually. And it's we have to break away from that thinking that if you experience sexual attraction to someone who you're not supposed to experience sexual attraction towards, and I put that in air quotes, um, that you're automatically gay, right? Because it's just so hard for us to fathom that we can hold complex identities and we can experience attraction beyond just the person that we want to have sex with. You know, we had this thing once, we did a, a podcast with somebody on fantasies and um, Anvita and I both realized that it, when we fantasize, we fantasize about women. Um, and when we're actually with our partners, that they're male. And again, you know, just explaining this to people was, um, it's not the easiest thing in the world. But I, I guess moving on to the, the next thing that again, a um, couple of people have been saying, and they've been writing in over and over again, that I think I'm bi, but now what? Like, how do I take it further? What do I do? Do you have any advice? Well, congratulations, first off. I think identifying in a world that forces you to erase your identity is powerful and it's rebellious. And so by, by folks experience tremendous mental health adversities, because, um, and even though 50% of the LGBT community identifies as being bisexual, we do suffer the most uh, high rates of um, depression and anxiety and suicidal ideation from the difficulty in coming to terms with that identity, right? Because it's easy for people to think that if you're somewhere on the spectrum, then you just don't exist because you just haven't made up your mind yet. So congratulations on coming out. I think that's awesome. And I will say that it's not, I would almost omit the now what, um, because coming out is a continuous journey and it's experiencing what being bisexual means to you, right? And everybody is so unique that, like I mentioned before, there isn't a criteria, there isn't a life plan that I can produce that would be replicable for every single person. I think it depends on your life circumstances. It depends on intersectionality and other intersecting identities. Um, how you choose to navigate the world, um, and even your location, right? I think a lot of these things can play a big role in how you navigate your bisexuality. But I like to emphasize a couple of things, which is um, I think chosen family and community can be incredibly affirming to your identity, to your um, sense of self, um, having people that can continuously reaffirm and validate who you are. And I had a group of friends in the beginning that when I was erasing my own identity, they were like, no, you're bi, stop it. Like you are a bisexual woman, embrace it. Um, and I think that was one of the more powerful things that I had sought out was finding a queer community where I feel validated, where I feel loved and reaffirmed. And just continuing to learn more about yourself and how you experience your own bisexuality, I think is what I would say to the now what. <laughs> I, uh, Marana, I, what you're saying is so interesting about the community because recently I had this experience as somebody was sharing something very similar that each time that they came out as a bisexual person, it could have been either way. Somebody could have said, no, you're straight. Somebody could have said, no, you're, you know, a lesbian. Yes. And like, they could have had multiple, and then accepting their identity was so difficult. However, yes. as soon as they found somebody who was affirming uh, yeah. as a mentor, as a guide, as a girlfriend, as a boyfriend, you know, as soon as they had somebody who had actually affirmed their own identity and their identity that was kind of like game changing for them to have that community where your identity is accepted it was really game changing 
So yeah, so that's really powerful. Yeah, I mean, I would also say I, I hate that most bisexual people I talk to, and this only just breaks my heart a little that they say, I'm bisexual, but, right? Like there's always a caveat, right? Because we've heard those comments from so many people, like I'm bisexual, but I've never dated someone of the same sex or gender. Mm. Mm. I'm bisexual, but I'm married. I'm, I'm a cis woman, I'm married to a cis man. I'm bisexual, but I only have straight friends, right? There's always this caveat. Why can't it ever just be I'm bisexual, period, oh. full stop. Mm. Um, do you have any recommendations for communities, organizations, et cetera, um, that we might be able to sort of recommend uh, to people? Right, yeah. Um, I know that Gezi India hosts a ton of um, queer events. Um, it's G-A-Y-S-I. I would follow them on Instagram. And actually, this is such a funny moment because I'm hosting like a like a bisexual support group um, on March 15th. I'll share some of the details with you. And this is a bi plus space. And we've hosted a couple before on as part of Tara Health Media, which is a, a sexual health database that is geared towards providing cultural, culturally informed sex education and sexual health for communities of color, but mainly focused on like queer um, South Asian and, you know, South Asian kids, because I know that there are a lot of, um, we are a very unique community and we have a lot of unique issues that are tied to our sexualities and our gender identities. And I like to emphasize and, and bring those to light. So um, that is one, and I would recommend that there are actually a ton of amazing pages on Reddit, and I think that that's really just how you find community, right, because I, you're on Reddit, or you're on Instagram, or you're on Twitter, follow them, you know, comment, engage with them, because I feel like that's how I met a lot of my amazing friends who are not just bi, but um, who are really affirming, who are gay, who are lesbian, and who see me for who I truly am. You don't have to exclusively find, you know, someone who shares exactly the same identifiers as you, but um, I would recommend some of those communities. And I can always share additional ones after this call as well. Brilliant. And then we can put them in the caption and then people Perfect. can access them more easily. I was just thinking about 20 odd years ago, um, I used to run a support group for young South Asian girls in this country, in the UK. So and with mm -hmm. I, I are both based in London, um, who young girls who were wanting to come out and were being told by their parents that this was against their culture and they couldn't. Um, and, you know, starting back there were just young girls wanting to come out and trying to find somebody who would hold their hand and say, it's okay, even to be South Asian and gay is all right. And we yeah. have come a long way. Uh, we have come a long way that, you know, we now have support groups for so much more than that, which is fantastic. Yeah. <laughs> okay, um, coming into the next one, which is, what's the difference between childhood fantasies of being bi and actually being bi as an adult? I don't know, like you said, you can't actually quantify something like this. But yeah. a lot of times when people ask these questions, I think that they really are looking to see how much of an answer we can provide them in the simplest terms. So if you can find some way of responding to that, that'd be great. So I will say that culturally speaking, in the context of, of a country like India, where there are so many diverse cultures and there are languages, right? So I think in specific, so I live in New York City and I think that using this as a comparison, I think I had seen some interesting headlines that said, why are so many more Gen Z and you know younger kids coming out as queer? And I think it's because we have created communities that are safer and there are more people that are accepting who work in as public school teachers. You know, parents are accepting. But I also think is that they, we have found language to describe it. Right? Like we didn't have terms like bisexuality plus. And so when you really think about India and its diversity and all the languages there isn't sufficient language, right? Or sort of like a, a cultural uh, archives even to say, um, we haven't really archived queer life. We haven't 
um, documented it enough. So when you're growing up and you're really thinking about this, there isn't enough language to describe what you're going through. And that's why I think we, we tend to think in terms of extremes that if you have a fantasy about someone of the same sex that you are automatically gay because that's the language we have, right? Um, and I think that children as young as four can have a sense of what their gender is, right? And they can have a sense of whether they resonate with the gender that they were assigned at birth or whether they don't. And so I, you know, I have pictures of my brother wearing my dresses. You know, my parents put me in a suit and we kind of as children play around with our gender identity and are kind of who we are, who we have crushes on, right? And I think this kind of develops into puberty and, you know, as teenagers, we're kind of like experimenting and it depends on the context that we grew up in. And I, some kids can come out of that with like a term or a label such as bi, if they have access to that language. Others are just kind of just figuring it out, especially if you have a supportive environment. And, you know, if I have a kid and at that point, if I use language like partner or who are you dating, kind of using gender neutral term or trying to talk to them, you know, as we're talking about sex education and all of that stuff, you know, it's kind of, I hate to use the term phase, but it is a very critical phase though, because they are figuring out who they are attracted to, what their gender is, what their gender expression is. And that is so paramount to who they are as a person, right? And that can be fluid and it's very, very fluid, right? There are how they choose to identify is and set in stone. And I think the same can be said as an adult, right? Because right now I'm also kind of going through a fluid phase. I'm 32 years old. You know, I have my own house, I pay my bills, et cetera. I've already kind of gone through that phase as a teenager. But I think as an adult, I'm still having some of those questions, right? Where I'm still like, maybe I'm more pan um, than I am bisexual. But you know, pansexuality and bisexuality have a lot of like overlap. And I have that language to kind of describe it. Um, so I do think that there isn't so much of a difference. But if you are young and if you are having fantasies or if you are Kind of questioning stay in that phase but even if you do choose to like a label you know just know that it's not set in stone and how would you know so we also know and you were speaking about india and language and spaces um we know that just because of the taboo and shame around experimentation a lot of time happens yeah. with the same sex uh, partner because that's just you know like parents might allow you to go and spend time with the same sex person but not the opposite sex and everything uh, and that sometimes gets confusing for people as well that they it's just curiosity as a young person and you tend to experiment with same sex uh, and you know, what would you say to people who have experimented? Like, I find it troublesome to say you're not bi or you're not you're straight or that was just experimentation rather than keeping it just, you know, you tried something with someone and that's okay. So It's so important not to box people in. And I think that this is a problem that we fall into even today with this idea so I saw this interesting post I thought this someone had described that they are um they are lesbian but because they have sex with men that they are not lesbian and people were like you're not a lesbian and I think this is the thing right like no one can tell you what you are and these are labels and identities right and they they affirm who you are and they help you find community and a place in this world um, and at the same time, I think that this is the thing that we just need to understand is that sexuality and who you have sex with. So who you have sex with and your sexuality are not the same, right? And so your sexual identity and your sexual being is not the same as who you have sex with, right? So your, your label, you can be heterosexual. If you say I am heterosexual and you are, MSM is a very, uh, it's, it's a category now, men who have sex with men. And I actually do find that label very interesting, especially when it comes to HIV and AIDS research. And I only bring that up because when I was at Hopkins at the uh, doing AIDS research, we were looking at that where it was gay men, bisexual men, and then men who have sex with men, right? It's a very important category because again, who you had sex with is not your gender identity. It's not your sexual identity, sorry. So your sexual orientation can be heterosexual and you can have sex with men. 
you can have sex with women, you can have sex with whoever you want to have, right? And I think that the problem with the society, again, is that we like to tell people who they are based on the people that they have sex with, right? And so as you're growing up and you are exploring yourself, you're exploring your sexual orientation, yeah, I, having sex, having crushes can be valuable, but it isn't necessarily, it doesn't equate to, to one another. I really uh, like that. I, uh, sorry, uh, Anvita, I just no, wanted no, to interpolate with something. Um, I just did an article for Times of India. Um, I write this column for them. And um, I was saying that, you know, the term that comes up now is heteroflexible, which mm. is what Gen Z uses. And I just think that it's it's such a good word, you know, to be able to just expand your mind to fit that because you you do have to expand your mind to fit that particular word. Um, and I know that the reaction it gets is like, oh, you know, like bloody kids, yeah. uh, but it's, um, and I'm, okay, I like this term. I hadn't come across uh, this one, men who have sex with men. Yes. So you said it's called uh, MSM? MSM, yes. Um, because we just received this email uh, from this guy who said, he's going through a tough time. He's married, he's straight, blah, blah. But he says that when he needs solace, he performs oral sex on men and he finds that that comforts him. And, yeah, so, you know, there was this question around it. Yeah, sorry, go on, Amrita. No, no, I was just going to say that uh, this idea that the idea that men have had sex with men and we spoke about that, Seema, about from the Roman Empire, right? Like it's, it's a leisure activity and talking about it, it's interesting how HIV AIDS research always gets this fact that was true for even the NAS Foundation in London. Um, they were finding a lot of heterosexual women uh, contracting HIV. And what turned out was that their partners who were in a heterosexual marriage went, had leisure sex yeah. with men. And that is why they were contracting it. And you know they found the spots that were most common for it and everything. And, um, but they run a group also, uh, and they very categorically call it an MSM group. And they have a gay group, but they have an MSM group because exactly. a lot of Latin American and African men, uh, people from those continents, um, they think it's completely normal and okay to have sex with men, but don't identify as being gay. Um, so even yes. they run an MSM group. Yeah. So, um, and I now have a question, which I think, again, it's been coming up a lot, is how does a bi relationship work? Do I live with both partners or do I move in with one or do I live between homes? That is a good question. So we are conflating bisexuality with polyamory and those are not the same. They are not synonymous mm -hmm. with each other. Um, bisexuality is a sexual orientation. Polyamory is a relationship. Um, I want to use the word style, or I will say that it is a type of relationship. So when we think about monogamy and we think of polyamory, we think about ethical non-monogamy. Um, and so polyamory can include everything outside of monogamy, right? So this is swinging, this is um, ethical non-monogamy, you know, we've heard of throuples, right? And so everything that you're describing or in the question um, is polyamory. Monogamous people can be bisexual, right? And I don't think that your relationship status or your, the, the, the people that you seek out in your life um, are contingent on being bisexual. And I, I will explain that a little bit more, right? Um, polyamorous people can be bisexual, but not all bisexual people are polyamorous, right? And so I'll give myself as an example. I am in a monogamous relationship with my husband. I am bisexual. Me and him live together and there is no one else involved in our relationship. It is just the both of us. And to me, my sexual orientation and my sexual identity are still very valid um, and they exist. I am very much a bisexual woman, even though I am in a monogamous marriage, right? 
And I think that, again, I want to bring back this caveat, right, that many people feel like their bisexuality is not valid because they are in a monogamous relationship and they have to be in a polyamorous relationship, right? And again, this is rooted in biphobia and the idea that bisexual people are inherently promiscuous um, and confused and need to have a lot of sex in order to validate their own identities. But this is not true, right? How do you know that you are straight when you are like 13 years old, right? And you haven't kissed anyone and you haven't even held hands with someone and you're like, I'm straight and I have a crush on them. Why can't the same exist, you know, for bisexuality and for other kind, you know, identities within the LGBTQ community? Um, and I really want to extend this to tell this person that, you know, you are bisexual in a relationship. It's literally just that, like you are a complex human being. This is your sexual orientation. Um, you can choose to be polyamorous if you want to, but most people are monogamous and very happily bisexual. Um, and so I think it really depends on what you are into and the kind of relationship that you seek. So Paruna, what you said is really powerful and it's a great role model. Uh, what do you say to people who are very afraid that their bisexual identity gets lost when they, you know, they are in a committed monogamous relationship, uh, you know, so you have a husband, so the world might see you as a heterosexual couple in some ways, and you are coming out as a role model saying, I'm still bisexual yet, uh, but also how is the process for you to you know choose like was it difficult to give up you know was it confusing or difficult to say now people might not see me as bisexual if I get married or how was that process I mean it was very difficult right and I I don't enjoy the word passing um because I do think that it, it reinforces the the societal structures that we live in but I will say that you know, being in a heterosexual passing relationship offers me, and I did a post about this a couple of, and I've had some really interesting conversations about this, where it offers me a definite privilege, right? Because we do live in, in violently heteronormative cultures that prioritize that. And so if I was in a same-sex relationship or if I was visibly queer, it's that much harder for me to access healthcare. It's harder for me to, you know, get a loan so that I can educate myself, sign a mortgage, buy a house, et cetera, right? Because there are so many biases that, that exist within us, like our societies. Um, and I will say that being in, in a heterosexual passing relationship definitely awards me many privileges. Um, but it is a double-edged sword, right? Because it is extremely erasing. And I think this exactly. is something that I had brought up before that we suffer from elevated rates of de depression, anxiety, and uncertainty around our identities. And I think being in relationships, um, and it, it is almost, you know, we, we face a lot of flack from both sides of the community. I had gone to a gay bar and I was dancing with someone and they, I said, oh, I'm married. And they were like, no, no, I just want to dance with you. So I was like, okay, cool. Like we're just dancing. And it was me and another woman. And um, and then I was, we were just having a normal conversation and I said, yeah, my husband is a, is, you know, X, Y, and Z. She's like, your husband, I thought that you were queer. And I was like, I am. So I think that this is such an interesting con. And she's like, what are you doing in a gay bar then? And I was mm -hmm. like, oh, okay. You know, this is not, queerness is not an aesthetic. I don't have to look queer to be queer. Right. But that's, I, at that point I was like, First of all, that's a very interesting conversation to have with someone, right? And I was in a gay bar, which is exclusively like, you know, gay men, more geared towards gay men. And someone had um, called me, um, and this is a slur, so, so don't repeat it. It is um, a fag hag, and, you know, a fag is a, a slur used towards the queer communities, especially if you're gay, it's used in a very derogatory sense. And it is referred towards straight women who only exclusively have gay friends. And I think that, you know, when you listen to sentences like this, or when you hear sentences like, luckily my friend stood up for me and was like, she's actually bi, so she's in a queer circle right now. Like she's valid and she deserves to be here. But I think it's interesting that when you talk about your life and you talk about the way you look and et cetera, that 
I think the world needs such a like an immediate reminder of who you are. And sometimes I feel like I talk about my bisexuality because it's an act of rebellion because you're trying so hard to erase. But sorry, you can't. <laughs> I'm gonna keep mm-hmm. talking about it, about how fabulously bisexual I am. Um, and I that I just wanted to bring that up, right? So it is a double-edged sword, and that I, I I deal with a lot of flack from the from the LGBT community and from you know the heterosexual straight community, but it's also that I have a lot of privileges in my relationship and that I'm able to navigate a really heterosexual lifestyle. God, it's like a, it's like quicksand, isn't it? It's like a swamp. We walk along (laughs) and at every step you can sink and it's like, how the hell do you keep going? Um, Yeah. Yeah. And I I think that, uh, one, uh, what I really feel is that you have to keep proving your identity rather than people just being like it gets erased or it gets uh, passing, but you just have to keep identifying with it or like, you know, it's so that yeah. feels really, um, you know, like it feels really difficult that you have to constantly reaffirm it in some ways and it couldn't just be uh, it has to be reaffirmed each time. Right. And I think that this is why it is so important that we have affirming spaces and we find, so I go for therapy and I have a queer therapist, right, who is also a member of the LGBT community. And I talk a lot about this with her. And I also have a very, very supportive partner and a group of friends who are bi, who identify as being bi, gay and lesbian. And so when people who are ignorant make comments, especially on the internet or in real life, to me, it, it no longer bothers me because I feel like I have such a, a like a rooted existence and identity and I'm very lucky. And that's why I, again and again, I'm, I, I feel like this is so, why it's so important to keep having these conversations and to keep having kind of like a North Star or like um, almost like a group that you gravitate towards because mm. In the end, everyone's going to tell you what you aren't. This is what people love to do. They love to tell you who you are and who are you who are not. And I think as women, South Asian women, you know, and as a queer woman, I think that this you just deal with it a lot. Um, and I'm I'm extremely grateful and privileged to have this really amazing community around me that is like, don't listen to them. They have no idea what they're talking about. You're so by. So, yeah. so I have to tell you that um, you know, a lot of our a lot of the people who are my friends, you know, the circle of friends that I have around me, have kind of come to accept that Seema talks about sexuality. Seema is just going to say stuff that most of us wouldn't talk about, but we kind of smile quietly and listen. Yeah. Um, and the other day, I said this at a party. I said, you know, we were talking about this question that Anvita and I answered last time about this young man who said that he's very young. His only intimate relationship till now has been with his best friend, who's also a guy. And he says, I'm not gay, but that's been my relationship till now. And I was trying to explain to these ladies that that happens all the time. I mean, I, you know, when you're younger, especially in India, you don't necessarily have access to people of the opposite sex. And so the only experimentation you're going to do is with people of your mm-hmm. own sex, mostly, or at least up to a certain age. And I was saying how growing up, I went to boarding school when I was five years old. And it was an all girls boarding school and there's a certain amount of experimenting that was done. And, you know, they listened to this part of it because this is acceptable. Okay, yes, you know, you're a young kid and a senior takes you along for this. And I said to them, but you have to understand that I enjoyed the experience. I thoroughly enjoyed it. Hence, I wished to repeat it. So in the earlier part of my growing up, I did have one, two, maybe even three friends or maybe four friends along the way with whom I shared this intimacy till I got old enough to find somebody from the opposite sex and then, you know, understand what I like better or what I prefer or whatever. But those fantasies and that pleasure didn't ever go away. I mean, that's always stayed in my mind. And there was just this shocked silence because it was like, that was a step too far. Oh, okay. Um, Yeah. (laughs) You know, that you said that you enjoyed it and you willingly repeated it, uh, you know, the experience. And just trying to explain to people that, um, you know, this is something that the body and the brain reacts to. It's it's what turns you on. It makes you excited. And then you can move forward um, in whichever way you want. You can decide. 
Um, I, sorry, Anna, that we, Seema, we no, I was just going to say next time you can say to them that your sexual identity is completely different from who you're sexually active with. So you can be sexually active with girls, but you can identify as a heterosexual so, or heteroflexible or whatever. Uh, so that's, you gonna, know, you can use that tomorrow now the next time. time. Well, yeah. I'm going to quote Marona the next time, but it really was such a show. It, and, you know, a lot of them said, oh, but would you say this again in front of people? And I said, well, I say it. I say it in interviews. I say it in public. Yeah. I, and people are going to listen to this podcast and they're going to now label me some more. I mean, I'm bad enough yeah. as it is. Um, but unless you have something on it, I have one final question to ask you, Varuna. No, I was just going to add, and that was what, you know, Varuna had said, uh, that that person had specifically said, I am not gay. You know, he had chosen that this was something that he enjoyed, he liked it. Uh, each time they met, they, he wanted to engage in it, but he did not identify as gay. And I, I think what you were saying earlier, Varuna, about um, giving the choice, uh, you know, giving what resonates for somebody yeah. and what their preference is, um, is is more important uh, than who they're having sex with or how they are. So their identity is very different um, from what they might be experimenting with or enjoying. And I really hope that everybody listening is actually going to take this on board and that it's been reiterated. Sorry, Varun, I interrupted you. you no, not at all. No, I was just going to reiterate that same fact as well, where I was going to say that identifying as queer, right? Queer used to be a slur. Again, queer used to be something that was weaponized against us. And, you know, depending on who you have sex with or however you identify, right? I think it's an act of rebellion in this world that forces you to... to to conform and to identify as being straight. And they love those labels, right? They, we love gender reveal parties. We love to say, no, that's a boy. He likes pink. Um, you will marry a man, you are straight, right? And so I think that exploring your sexual identity and, and understanding that you are someone, again, who's complex, who can experience emotional, romantic, and sexual attraction to multiple people um, and the, at the end of the day, they're all just labels, right? They're all just identities. And, but it and really, I think making a, making a yeah. point of what you just said, that you can experience all kinds of um, yeah. attraction, but you don't necessarily have to follow that through. You can be monogamously with somebody in your yeah. chosen identity and yet feel everything else as well. Exactly. No, I absolutely agree. So I want to finish with one last question, which also I think about three people in the last week sent in saying, um, what if my partner is not bi? I feel like you've answered it to some extent, but would you yeah. repeat that bit for us? Yeah, absolutely. Right. And so bisexuality. So I'm bisexual. My partner is heterosexual. I know a ton of people who are bi, whose partners are also bi. Right. And that is that they're the people that they are sexually like sexually attracted towards is more than the person that they are sleeping with or that they are in a relationship with. And so it's not necessary. Again, this is one of those criteria that we seem to be obsessed with is that if I'm by my partner needs to be by. In most cases, you don't have to be with someone who is by. Uh, I know a ton of by people that are in relationships with uh, a gay person so I know like same-sex couples one of them is a lesbian and another one is bisexual um, and again as much as I would say that my my relationship looks heterosexual passing in that case their identity could also be erased because it looks like a homosexual relationship or a same-sex relationship right um, but one of the people in that relationship is bi and so I don't really think that you need to be with someone who is bisexual. You just need to be with someone who affirms who you are and allows you to be your best bisexual self. And I would just reinforce that, that I think if somebody is biphobic or, you know, yeah. is homophobic, then that might not be a partner that you'd exactly. want to go with. It has to be somebody that is affirming, uh, is open, um, you know, it's not going to put down your identity in any way if it were right. to come up. So I think that is way more important than them being 
from the same, you know, they, that they're both bisexual or they're both, uh, both partners are gay or bisexual. It's more that they're affirming of your identity. Uh, and that could be true even if you have a gay partner and the gay partner is not affirming of your bisexual identity, that's as bad as a heterosexual partner not affirming your bisexual identity. Yeah, I love that. That is very, very true because I feel like even though my partner identifies as being heterosexual, is incredibly affirming, is incredibly supportive, and that's all that I could ask for. Ladies, thank you so much, both of you, for being over here. Everyone, of course, out there knows and loves Anvita, um, Dr. Anvita Madan Behel, who is a psychosexual therapist and is absolutely wonderful at everything that she does on this podcast. And Varuna, we have been so privileged to have you with us today. Really, it's been um we've been wanting to do this for so long and i'm so happy we finally made it happen and i'm sorry about the last couple of times of my messing up um, and not <laughs> making enough. it happen um so generally when we finish we always ask uh, people that if they want to get in touch with somebody is there a place where if somebody has questions uh varuna is there somewhere that they can reach out to you yeah, they can follow me on my Instagram. That's at D-R-V-A-R-U-N-A-S-R-I-N-I-V-A-S-A-N. So that's at Dr. Varuna Srinivasan. And then you can also follow at Tara Health Media, where, which is a sexual health database. And we actually have a comprehensive queer database that explains all uh, the queer terminology. So if you have any questions, then you can DM us. Uh, did you say uh, Tara Health? T-A-R-A? Yes. I will put it in the chat here. Um, and Brilliant. Then... So um, we will put that in our um, caption below so that everybody can access that more easily. Um, and of course, if you need to get in touch with Anvita for a consultation, she is at anvita.medanbehel at gmail.com. But once again, it'll be in the caption below. Um, <laughs> And if you want to send any questions in to me, I am on info.seema.anand at gmail.com. Um, we receive our questions over there and we try and answer them as best as possible. I hope that you found this um, podcast useful. And if you did, please do comment, like, subscribe. In the meantime, look after yourself, stay healthy, and we will see you here very soon again.